my religious background, I was just, you know, raised by my dad and um, uh, my mom, um, five brothers and three sisters. We had a big family. Um, I remember uh, developing an interest in, you know, theology, as all of my siblings have, because my dad would rant and rave at the head of the table and uh, when we sat down to eat. And uh, because, you know, since we all identified with, you know, the leadership of my dad, um, we all started to identify with theology. So um, we couldn't we couldn't escape it. And another big thing was, you know, my dad just applied and my mom applied theology to all to everything. And as a result, whenever we watch movies, we couldn't get we couldn't get through a movie without a theological lesson somewhere if my dad or my mom saw something. Now my dad was a lot more vocal. My mom would just shut it off. But my dad would be like, turn this off. You know, and and he would get super, super mad. Um, and then he'd start complaining about it. We'd be like, why dad? Why? Why? Or sometimes we'd watch a movie and like my dad would make an observation. Like I think one of my dad's greatest observations was you ever seen the movie um Silence of the Lambs? No, I know the general thing, the Hannibal Lecter story. Hannibal Lecter, right? So he's 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 a um Okay, we he's Hannibal the Cannibal, right? So we all know that. Um, uh, at the end of the movie, Hannibal hangs up the phone, and he starts to track the the um, um, the head of the um, mental facility where he was at. Now, the head of the mental facility was a jerk. He was this big fat jerk, and he was a guy who was all about the fame and the money. He didn't care about the patients. He kind of basically used them for himself. And uh, at the end of the movie. Hannibal tracks him down. He says goodbye to Clarice and he hangs up and then he puts a hat on a fedora and he starts, he turns around, and he starts tracking the uh, former head of the institution where he was at. Um, and um, at the end of the movie, you're wishing and hoping that Hannibal tracks him down and eats him. And my dad would get so mad and he, and he start making a lot of holes in the air with his finger, you know, at the end of that movie, we're like, dad, what's the problem? He's like, see, he's like, see, see what they're doing here. They they want you to they want you to root for cannibal a uh, Hannibal so that he'll cannibalize this guy. This guy did nothing like worthy of being eaten. He's just a jerk. But look who you're rooting for for at the end of this film. You're rooting for this cannibal to eat this man. And that's how the the the, the Hollywood would manipulate you know the viewers. And and my dad just saw right through it. And as a result, now now me or none of my viewers, neither me nor my siblings can watch a film without. Judging it scripturally, we just can't do it. It's just impossible. Um, so that that was a big part of you know growing up. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, growing up, uh, you know, and uh, attended. I think uh, as my dad was working through, um, and my mom were working through Reformed theology. They came out of a heavy dispensational background, huge dispensational background. Washington Bible College, you know, like Christ is coming back in your lifetime and all that kind of stuff and. You're going to see it and, you know, 88 reasons for rapture in 88 and then 88, nine reasons for rapture in 89. And, um, you know, uh, so they came out of that background, but then they kind of shed that and we kind of watched them shed that background. But we still kind of attended dispensational churches in some way. We were affected by dispensational. Our parents never taught us that. But um, I was we were still affected by dispensationalism and premillennialism. And uh, as we got older, we started to develop uh, our our own theology, um, and that kind of led the whole family into post millennialism and theonomy. We, but we came from a dispensational background, um, non Calvinistic. I mean, it was just as Pietistic and like IFB as you can get, almost without really being independent fundamentalist Baptist. But that's um, that's that's my uh, background. I mean, once my dad and my mom kind of got into Reformed theology, the kids got into Reformed theology as we grew up. Thankfully, um, we didn't. Uh, thankfully, we didn't grow up with dispensationalism. So um, that's basically my theological background. My dad started quoting Rush, du- Rush Dooney, so I started reading some Rush Dooney. Uh, he was quoting Bonson, and so we started reading Bonson and all that kind of stuff. And that's how we got into theonomy, really. Um, but uh, I think a big book was Alvin Schmidt's How Christianity Changed the World. Uh, that was a big book for us, the whole family, really, because my dad just loved it so much. And, you know, we uh, I read it and I, and I was convinced of, uh, you know, through that book, I started searching the scriptures of, OK, what does it actually say about the future? And um, that's basically when I became a post-millennial. And uh, when did I become theonomic? I don't remember a time or a day when I didn't, well, I wasn't theonomic. 
Um, but I guess that kind of developed really from my mom and dad's influence and from, you know, I want to say biblical influence. And then from there, moving into why did you feel the need to write this book on this particular uh, topic? Yeah. So one of the things that, um, I was frustrated with, um, I asked, um, uh, I asked a, an author once who wrote a book about theonomy. I said, um, this is back in 2017. I said, why aren't we, uh, why aren't we talking about the Constitution? Because I was reading what the Constitution was saying, and I was reading what Psalm 119 was saying, and you know they weren't jiving. And my frustration was a lot of theonomists uh, were saying, we need to get back to biblical law, so let's get back to the Constitution. And my problem was, that's not the same thing. And a lot of theonomists' minds, it was. It was the same thing. Biblical a lot of people were arguing with for God's biblical law, but they weren't arguing for God's biblical um, uh, structure, right? They wanted the law, but without the structure. And as you and I have both realized, because I read your book, I both realized you can't you can't have um, uh, our current understanding of the Constitution. You can't have that and biblical law at the same time because they don't drive. You know, uh, the jury system, eminent domain, um, uh, the post office, uh, post office, roads, uh, forced taxation. These things don't jive with biblical law. And I, I started to realize eventually that foundationally, foundationally, biblical law disagrees with the Constitution. They, 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 dis they disagree foundationally. And uh, I was starting to get frustrated. Um, with Christians trying to say just a matter of like, let's go back to the constitution. Like, if we, no, we can't, we can't, we can't do that. We, we, we can't, even if we tried the same avenues would be followed to where we are now. Uh, it's just impossible. We can't do it. Um, but, but I mean, that was, that was, that was one part, but I, I was also chiefly concerned with explaining how a biblical system works without the influence of a statist mindset. That's what I was trying to keep me. Yeah, I'm not going to be like, oh, I, I got rid of all the status in my mind. I'm status free. No, I still have status affecting me. I just don't know where it is. Um, and I, I hope I don't know where it is anyway, because that would be idolatry. Uh, so I, I I'm, I'm trying to, the, the, um, the cursing the darkness portion of my book is trying to show people the statism that we have when it comes to the scriptures. We, we, we judge the Bible through the Constitution, and we say that would never work. And you're right, it would never work if we had the Constitution and the Bible at the same time. They don't work together. Um, and a lot of Christians just won't, they won't do that. They will not take the Constitution and uh, view it through the lens of Scripture. But what ends up happening is we view the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Bible through the uh, lens of the um, Constitution. And so... I, I, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. I didn't want to just be like, well, you know, the Constitution stinks. You know, I mean, and I hope that's not my message. I don't think the Constitution, Constitution stinks at all. I love the Constitution. Um, I think it's a great document. I think it's a very Christian document. Um, but but it has flaws that need to be fixed. And I was concerned chiefly to argue for a theocratic government to say that to make the same claims that the Bible makes about God's system of government because it makes claims about it. You know, there's claims in the scriptures about the effectiveness of God's system of government. Job 29, for example, you know, him as a judge. Um, and he makes all these crazy claims like, I was giving people justice right and left. And, you know, the widow and the orphan, they 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 came to me all the time. And and my question was, what what politician nowadays can make the same claims as Job? I, th I don't think any of them can. Not in our system. They can't say, oh, yeah, I gave people justice. No, when you go to your local like representative and you read the silliness that they that they brag about, like on their bio, he's been a representative for, you know, 16 years and he helped pass a law that benefits all the Pennsylvanians. Great. Great. Awesome. Just, you know, wonderful. And when you compare that to Job, he's like, I snatched the, I snatched the prey out of the, 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 the wicked people's mouth. You know, the, the widow sang for joy and the, and the orphan came running to me. And, you know, I, I searched out the cause of him. I did not know. And I'm like, there's no politician that can say that nowadays. And um, the purpose of my book was to argue chiefly for a theocratic system as the Bible defines it and not as Christians, how Christians view it through the lens of the Constitution or the lens of statism or the lens of American exceptionalism or what have you. Um, I believe we need to get rid of that, that 
that mindset of judging the Bible through uh, the things that have, that have gotten to our mind, the negative things that have gotten to our mind, or else we'll never be able to, um, you know, open my eyes that I might behold uh, wondrous things from your law. We'll never be able to do that if we're always judging it through um, uh, temporal understandings or status understandings of, of justice and uh, jurisprudence. And so that's why I wrote the book. I wanted to argue. I, I was always frustrated with the conservatives because they, 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 they always come up with a problem, but they never come up with a solution. You know, their, their solutions are terrible. Their solutions are awful. I mean, it's just, you know, like, what's the solution? Uh, uh, more education. And, and and to me, my understanding of uh, Democrats was, uh, or conservatives, like, I, I always agree, almost always agree with their problem. Almost always. Whenever they say a problem, I'm always, I'm, I'm right there with you. That's a problem. I just disagree with their solution. The Democrats, I disagree with their identification of the problem, and I disagree with their identification of the solution. But the only thing is the conservatives are usually right about the problem, but they're just solutions are terrible. And so I didn't want to be like them because their 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 problems are always right, but their solutions are terrible. Um, so I want to say, well, here's a solution. This is the God system of government. That's the solution. Here it is, chapter and verse. This is beginning and a middle and an end. I'm not being like, we just need more justice. You know, we just need to go back to what the what this country stood for. Okay, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. So um, I, I wrote the book to say, here's where it begins, here's where it ends, and here's everything in the middle. And you can identify it, you can know it. It's easy to understand. And if you view the the Bible the way it tells you to view the Bible, um, it, it, it's understandable. Whereas right now, we don't really understand the millions of laws that we have. That's why we have to hire experts. So yeah, that's the pretty much the elevator pitch of, of why I wrote the book. Is there a certain amount of certain type of feedback that you've gotten that you find most common? Like what's people's first reaction usually when you, when you start arguing for a theocracy? That's a good question. Um, basic, I think it's about three things that people usually say. Us usually I have enough time I have enough time to give people context, right? So I don't, I really just say we need a theocracy and leave it at that. Um, I, usually when I, when I argue for a theocracy, I make sure I have enough time to explain everything and try and, you know, attack as much statism as I can. Um, one thing I get a lot is, uh, I never thought about that before. That's one thing I get a lot. I know I never thought about that. I asked one guy once, um, who's, who's an expert in the constitution. I asked him, I said, um, um, you know, if we were to start a government tomorrow, should we try to do the constitution again? What would we change? He goes, I never thought about that. Okay. And, um, so that's, that's one thing I get. Uh, I never thought about that. Second thing I get, um, I remember a couple months ago, no, back in the beginning of this year, I had a breakfast with some, some guys and we were talking about these things and a pastor was there, a pastor of one of the biggest churches in Pennsylvania. Not, not like it was numbers, but like influential Presbyterian church, like, like, um, like it, it harkens back to Whitfield and Edwards and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, just that it's that kind of church. And it looks like it was made in that time too. It's just a really um, uh, popular Presbyterian church in Pennsylvania. He was, a, he was not the pastor, but he was a pastor there. And I said, in the meeting, I said, um, you know, we're going to have to have some difficult conversations about the constitution. That means looking at it critically. And to him, what he heard was, what, this is what he heard. He goes, okay, all right, uh, okay. So, so do you want to like march on Washington, D.C.? I was like, no, that's not what I said. You know, usually when I say, well, we need to look at the Constitution, people are like, you want to riot and you want to, you, you want to go to, um, you know, uh, you want to go to Washington, D.C. and tear the whole thing down and watch it go up in flames and you want to burn the Constitution. And that's just because I said we need to criticize it. Where did it go wrong? What did it do right? What did it do wrong? What, what, what do we need to fix? Um, you know, so one thing I get is an overreaction when I talk about the Constitution and, 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 and um, my main message, I'm, I'm trying not to say my main message is the, the problems with the Constitution. My main message is the, um, um, uh, the effectiveness of God's government. I'm trying to push people to, to the effectiveness of God's government. Here's, here's what we should be heading for. We shouldn't be trying to push this nation back to the Constitution. We need to push this nation towards biblical law. Um, and so, uh, one pe one thing I hear, I hear a lot when, when I start to criticize the constitution, um, is, well, you want to, you want to tear the whole thing down and you want to just have no government, you want anarchy. 
And I'm not, I'm not saying that, no. Uh, so another thing I get is an overreaction. Um, another thing is a, a misunderstanding of, of what I say in that people don't fully get it. People don't really fully get what I'm trying to say here. Um, they, they, I, I remember I had a, a Sunday school where I talked about all these things and one of the attendees came up to me later and I started, uh, we started talking about something and I was complaining at the time of a ticket I had gotten when I was in the, uh, when I was in the city, they had passed a law saying that whoever leaves their car running unattended uh, gets a fine now. Right. And I saw the fine. It was actually 15 bucks and there was like a $5 service fee. And then there was this category called other, other, just other 90 bucks. Okay, this is back in like 2008, 2009. I was warming up my car and I locked the doors in the city and a cop came and wrote me a ticket. Thankfully, I got off it because he wrote there on the wrong street. So there was a discrepancy, but the judge, so the judge threw it out. But I got a big lecture about how I'm not, I shouldn't be leaving my car running while unattended at four o'clock in the morning when it's zero degrees outside. Okay, yeah, someone was looking for cars to steal at that time. Sure. But, and I started complaining about this to my friend who was at the Sunday school where I had talked about all these things. And he said, well, you know, the law, you know, it's, it's for a good purpose. And I was like, you were at my Sunday school. I was like, all, all legislation outside of God's law is, is bad legislation, either dumb, it's wicked, it's misguided, naive, or it's, or it's stupid, you know? And, and I was like, this guy doesn't, he didn't really understand what I was saying. It did. He just didn't get it. Like, I was like, no law except God's law. That's it. And, and he had attended my Sunday school and he had agreed with a lot of what I said, but I, I feel like he didn't really fully understand what it was I was saying. He didn't compute it. So um, a lot of, a lot of times the people don't, the, the, the three general reactions are, it sounds good, but I don't really get it. Um, you want to tear down the, uh, you know, you want to march, on, you want to march on DC. And um, I haven't thought about that. So those are usually the three things I get. How would you define statism or what would be the best analog term in scripture to the state? Uh, st statism, you know, I've seen your comment that we shouldn't be using the word the state. And, and I, I see what you're saying. And I, and I think it's uh, I think it's actually a really good thought. And it requires it requires a, um, more thought from me about how to best apply what you said there. Um, uh, statism to me is any time that the. Um, the civil government as it exists today uh, is doing something that God has not authorized them to do. That's to me, statism. Um, and I believe that there are statists who are arguing for, that's what they want. They want the government to basically do, you know, the inverse of what God has told them to do. Um, and then there are people who, who do believe in the constitution and they do believe in three branches of government, but I wouldn't call them statists. You know, I, I just wouldn't call them status. You know, I mean, I, I commit idolatry, you commit idolatry, but our life is not defined by idolatry, Lord willing. Um, you know, even though we commit idolatry, we're not idolaters. Uh, so, um, so, so statism would be uh, anytime that the civil government is doing something that the God has not authorized them to do. And a statist would be somebody who is actively arguing for the government uh to be doing things it should not do or or to do more things that it should not be doing yeah more things yeah yeah right Ex expanded even bigger yeah so that's that's my understanding of statism the 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 government uh the civil government doing things i i use it the same way that the uh the founding uh not the founding fathers but the reformers use popery you know like um anytime that they saw like a sacrament that wasn't in scripture or you know uh, whatever, you know, sort of uh, religious ceremony going on, the Bible never authorized this as popery. To me, popery is the new, uh, statism is the new popery. And, and um, uh, you know, the state is the new Catholic Church, just overblown, affecting God's hands and everything. And I believe the next Reformation will, in the same way through, we threw off the chains of the Catholic Church, Lord willing, our Reformation will throw off the chains of the state. There's one passage in Daniel 5, but Nebuchadnezzar became proud and stubborn, so his power was taken away from him. He was taken off his royal th throne and stripped of his glory. I think there's another prophecy even before the, the Israel was taken into captivity, where it talks about, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and do all these things because you've been disobedient. But then also Babylon is going to go too far. 
and they're going to do more than I wanted them to do, and so then I'm going to punish them. If I mean, if you've read my book, I've got that chapter in there about the jurisdiction in a nation without borders, which is, I mean, it's just the idea that we've been subjugated. The church has been subjugated, and so God's punishing us for our wickedness. I want to thank you for that observation because a question came up in, in my Sunday school, like, who makes the borders? And I realized after, because I, I, well, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that Israel had, an, had a nation for 40 years without borders. You know, they were in the desert for 40 years, and they were a nation, and they had laws, and they were governed correctly. As far as I know, there wasn't like this massive, like, they didn't, they didn't break up, and they had no borders. You know, how, how's that possible? You know, for everyone who's like, oh, border protection, border protection, you know, border wall, put, put up the wall. I'm like, well, how did these, how did these knuckleheads walking around with their clothes growing around them and their sandals growing with them? How did they have a nation for 40 years and no borders? How's that possible? You know, what, 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 wasn't everyone just coming in and just destroying everything? You know, I mean, like, how, how's that possible? But, but your observation in the book where you said, okay, it's your jurisdiction. And, and I, I started to realize that. After after you made that observation, I, I realized I think the, na- the the borders of a nation, I think, come down to um, the ba- basically the judges of ten. Where are your ten people? You know, and 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 the people on the border of of the mass of of people who are under a nation, it's going to be constantly changing because you know, as you said, as people realize, hey, this is a great nation to live in. The only thing I have to do is give up my wickedness, and boy, do I want to do that! And uh, uh, you know, I just can't be—I can't be a bad person. Just don't be a bad person, and, and you'll be fine. Um, and uh, you know, ba- basically speaking, um, and uh, there's going to be people at the border who are like, "Okay, put me into the system," and then that border is going to encompass, it's going to encroach on the other nation's border. It's just going to happen. Um, and and I think what's going to happen is in, in the theocratic nation. The nations around us are going to be putting up walls to keep to, to keep their people from from joining. That's what I think is going to happen, and and as a result, um, I think you know I, I I am a globalist in in this sense that I think someday it just kind of like it's global right now. The word okay, you know, this is global. Everybody knows what okay means. Um, so everyone knows what hospital means and taxi. Everyone knows what a handshake means. Everyone in the world no, but we generally all get it. You know. Um, I believe that God's law will become like that. We just, we just get it. We get it. You know, I mean, if, if, if you steal, this is what you do. If you kill someone, this is what you do. If you commit adultery, this is what you, I just, everyone's going to have the same knowledge that you and I can basically go anywhere in the world and you hit, stick out your hand, person is going to grab it and you're going to shake hands as a sign of trust. I believe the biblical law will be the same thing. And so I think when that happens, our, our idea of nations are going to change, and it's going to be less about political borders, and it's going to be more about borders of faith and culture, and that's where the borders are going to be drawn. And they're going to be natural borders that people recognize rather than the state saying, okay, here's our country, there's your country, and all that kind of stuff. Because mostly, the biggest difference when it comes to borders in, uh, in countries, the biggest difference is rarely ever geography. You know, It's more about law. What changes when I cross the border? Well, nothing really, just law. Um, and a lot of times it's language and law. and People's and, expectations and of what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing. Yes, but once God's law reaches the coastlands, we're all going to know, you know, what, 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 what I mean, we're all going to, as a, as a world, we're going to be a lot more familiar with what's right and wrong. And we won't be as concerned when we cross the border about the rules changing because the basic rules will be the same. And uh, th- that's that's my hope and my prayer. I think we're you know a long way away from that, but I think that your observation, okay, jurisdiction. I think the borders of a nation are going to come down to where do the judges of ten, where do they live, and where do the people live? That's the border. You know, that's basically how, how you how you're going to uh, identify your nation. That's 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 just my that's my initial thought. It's not a hell I'm willing to die on, but yeah, your thought about the people that were they were a nation when they were in Egypt and God yeah. judged them differently based on their behavior. So it's like, if you're serving God, then you'll be protected and the people around you will be judged. Exactly. Even though it doesn't matter. You're living next door to one another. Right. 
Yeah, and, and that's true, especially in the book of Judges, when they had all that peace, they had all the land had rest, but they didn't have a border wall. How? How, how did they have 80 years of peace when they didn't have a border wall? Wouldn't the Philistines just march them right in and just killing everybody and throwing it all up? I mean, wh- why? How? That's my question. Mm-hmm. How did how did, they had no immigration policy? They, they, you couldn't tell someone, oh, you can't come in. You know, there's nobody at the borders going, yes and no, you can't. There's no identification. You know, I mean, and so so how in the world did they have 80, 200 years, 40, 80, 40, 40? How did they do that without an immigration policy? And 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 it's the effectiveness, it's the effectiveness of God's law and God's judicial system that was able to control the people coming in and the people living there in such a way they didn't need a border wall, just didn't need it. That if you're a bad person and you're walking into Israel, you're putting your life at risk, and it's your fault. And you know, bad people just couldn't thrive the way they could in other countries. They just couldn't do it. And uh, I think that's it's so interesting. The effect again, Deuteronomy four, as you talk about a lot in your book, Deuteronomy four. You know, the the attitude of the nations around you is going to be one of awe and respect, and so the people coming in there are going to be already respectful. It's just uh, I, I I've I'm frustrated with the uh, modern understanding of of borders and and walls and stuff like that. It's, it's also interesting too. what when there were like your also your com- comment about them wandering in the wilderness how did they have like how did they decide who was in and who was out well obviously they had the mark of the covenant circumcision but then also you've got caleb who uh, i mean caleb in hebrew literally means dog his name was dog and that was people's name for those of the other nations and so they just named him that but it, caleb became this you know when it was spying out the promised land who was it it was joshua Jesus and the faithful Gentile are the faithful right. are the faithful ones. And yeah, so it's this whole thing. It's like, well, you'd say, oh, well, they were defined because they were descendants of Abraham. Well, no, not Caleb. Caleb was one of the most honored people, right. Uh, right. the longest living, one of the only two people who got to go into the promised land. Right. What What do you think about this? I, I've wanted this for a while. What do you think? Okay. So you had twelve. You had twelve spies. Uh, ten were bad and two were good. Right. So so there, there's the there's the two and the ten. Okay. Israel rebels. There's the ten tribes who are unfaithful and there's the two who are. Jacob had twelve sons. There's the ten he didn't love and the two that he did. And I'm wondering why does this theme keep showing up? where it's two and ten. Two were good and ten were bad, just generally speaking. It just keeps coming up after over and over. I mean, there, there's exceptions like, um, <clears throat> you know, who's on the Lord's side? Two nations, two two uh, tribes didn't say we are. It was just one. It was the Levites. But, you know, I've seen that three times. And, and it's big moments in, in the history of Israel where two were faithful and ten were not. And and, and I wonder what the significance is. Is, is that is that an indication of the general faithfulness of the nation of the people of Israel at the time, 20% were, cause I was one of that, like, you know, God punished the, 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 the nation who was actually faithful. Were they all bad? Every single one of them. Um, and it, it appears in, um, it appears from Psalm, I forget the Psalm, but he's like, you know, for 40 years, I loathed that generation. It appears they were all bad. Um, but it, to me, I, the only thing I can do with that is like that's an indication of how many people were faithful at any given point in Israel. Twenty percent, or excuse me, eighteen percent about were, were were actually faithful. So I don't know. What do you think about that? It just seems to be God's generally winnowing the people out over time, and it's like, okay, well, if you're if you hate me, then I'm going to pursue you to the third, the the fourth, and the fifth generation. Of them who hate me and to the thousand of them who love me and so it it just gives us a very stark contrast a very uh a very harsh look at ourselves where most people are not faithful to god the people that actually like really please god a lot there's v- relatively few of them agree and uh what's the passage in the new testament that says if the righteous are scarcely saved what will become of the wicked yeah. It's like, yeah, you were saved, but also, according to that verse, you were barely saved. Yeah. And we're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. 
So it's like, it's not a passive salvation. It's supposed to be an active salvation. And so talks about it like uh, a race sin so easily entangles and it's a competition and we're supposed to run that you may, that we may win. And so to think of yourself as being like in this special club because, oh, I'm not like my forefathers. I'm better. I have a better pedigree or I was raised better or blah, 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 whatever it might be. It was no, all of those people who can say those same things are, have, have been destroyed eventually because they didn't remain faithful. So I have not read your book, full disclosure. Um, so you have a one up on me. Um, okay. is the, do you have a sort of a concluding chapter? Like a, what, what should I do? Uh, yeah, I, I do. And it's not, um, it, it's not, um, it's not as uh, applicable or as specific as yours. Yours is a little more specific than mine. Uh, mine's a little bit more general and it's, it's more limited in that, um, my conclusion, I mean, I, I, I talk about in the second to last chapter, the short term solution. And then in the uh, 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 last chapter, I talk about the long term solution. So I, I really like Matt Charella's book, um, uh, Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates. You know, there are things that people can do right now that protect, you know, basically the problem. I mean, one of the biggest problems is government overreach, the federal government coming into people's lives and just destroying everything. There's a way to fight against that with your local sheriff and your local city council. They have power. They have authority given to them by the Constitution and their bylaws to do something about that. So I direct people to um, Matt's book in my book to say, listen, if you want to know what you can do now, um, uh, read Matt's book because it will arm you uh, or at least get you fired up to do something locally. And you can do that with he's filled with stories of things that people did locally, you know, sheriffs kicking out federal agents, sheriffs kicking out the ATF, sheriffs, you know, kicking out the FDA, saying you can't come out here. You have no jurisdiction. I have authority out here. You know, and if we just had, you know, if we had a sheriffs that were not afraid and, and didn't care about government money, man, I think the problem, a lot of our problems go away. Really, I do. Um, and so that was the, I believe the short-term solution is to know, I mean, you can, uh, you can fight a, you can fight a rear guard defense against the encroaching wickedness, but we cannot maintain a system that's always fighting against encroachment because, um, uh, they have the power, they have the resources, and they have all the time in the world uh, to to just you know keep encroaching into our lives. Um, the foundational philosophies that that run this nation are different than the foundational philosophies um, of the Bible. They're just different. Um, and in the first part of my book, I quote um, John Adams, who said, "You know, this Constitution is for religious, moral, and religious people. It is wholly inadequate." For the governing of any other that philosophy is not a good philosophy to build if you know your bible um if you know your bible that philosophy is not a good philosophy upon a philosophy upon which to build your nation because the bible makes the opposite claim the bible says the law is not for the just but it's actually for the unjust we got adams over here saying it's for a good people the bible saying this is for a bad people and so one is an objective uh, claim that reflects reality, and one is, I hope everyone's a good boy. And, um, you know, uh, and it's just uh, a lot of people won't, won't agree with John Adams. And a lot of people do agree with John Adams, and they say, see, look how good it is. Look how uh, the Constitution for a moral religious people. I know, we're not moral and religious anymore. Do you agree that it's inadequate? Are you going to say that? No, you're not going to say that. You know, pe people, this this cognitive dissonance that that the the conservatives have. Uh, a lot of people, it's not just the conservatives, but you know, I'm, I'm picking on them. But the Christians, you know, just generally speaking, they, they'll agree with the first part. It's for a moral and just people. See, see, that's good. No, it's bad because the Bible says that the law is for the unjust. That's why we have the law. And and uh, these two foundational philosophies are are different from each other, and um, you know one one reflects something that's going to happen, and the other one reflects something I hope I hope this is going to happen. 
uh, and, and one is adequate, as we have seen, especially in the book of Judges, with all the peace that they had, they had the land had rest. Um, uh, the book of Judges reflects the effectiveness of God's law and God's system. Um, and and uh, whereas our system, um, we haven't had rest in years. We haven't had rest since 1973. And, and I've heard someone say that's a conservative estimate. You know, they, they, went, they went 80 years with spiritual and physical rest. Can you imagine being born into a society that saw 80 years of spiritual and physical rest? Can you imagine that? Living a whole life and just never seeing war. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and not seeing the, the, the slaughter of innocence that we have. We have a systematic slaughter of innocence. Not seeing the rampant sexual perversion. I mean, you, you don't get rest and those things at the same time. But they did. And uh, not only that, I mean, people say, well, that's just, you know, legal rest. No, it's it, when when Josiah, you know, he starts burning the bones and he goes and he tears his clothes. He starts reading the law. They had a Passover. And the Bible says the author of Second Kings says Josiah observed the Passover. And it says not since the time of the judges, nor in all the days of the kings, David, Solomon. Golden days of the kings. They never saw a Passover like this. But during the time of judges, they had it all the time. So not only did they have legal superiority, but they also had spiritual superiority in the time of the judges. And I, I think that um, you know, the found and, and it was the found it was the foundational philosophy of the law saying this only works when people are bad. And we know as good Calvinists that people are bad. We know that. So we would never institute a system that says this only works if we're all good. No, the Bible is banking on you being a scumbag. You know, Paul's got all his chips. He's got all of his chips and he's got two options on the roulette board. You know, he's got he's got I hope everyone's good or I know everyone's going to be bad. He's going to take all his chips and he's putting them all on the I know everyone's a bad. And, and John Adams is, and the, 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 a lot of the framers are putting all their chips on I hope everyone's good. And uh, one of those is going to win and one of those is going to lose. And we have a have a track record, um, uh, you know, because I want to stay away from, you know, like, well, you know, it was never really truly tried. No, it was truly tried by 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 generations of people in Israel that many people say, um, you know, I mean, when I ask people this, this is one this is one comment that I get all the time. We're not a comment, but this is one answer I get all the time when I ask people, you know, sum up the book of Judges. Sum up the book of Judges in a phrase. This is what happens 90% of the time. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You know, that only says that twice in the book of Judges. Twice it says it in the book of Judges. And then um, early on in the book, the, the land had rest appears four times. So why are we walking around summing up the book of Judges with everyone did what, did what was right in his own eyes. Why, why did we reduce it? It only says it twice. Why don't we view it as the land had rest? It says it four times. And it only says the land had rest one more time in the Bible. And that was King Asa or uh, Jehoshaphat or somebody. I forget who it was. He had seven years. Seven years of rest. And, and, and why, why do we sum up the book of Judges with everyone did what was right in his own eyes? We are just so poorly equipped to understand that book. Golden days. Golden days of Israel, book of Judges, put me on the record, golden days. But we view it as Christians as a time of chaos, as a time of confusion, as a time of rampant disorder. But if you read it, because the Bible just casually mentions it, just on a land breast. You know, that's not even counting. The judges were just as he, there was a judge here, he ruled this long, there was a judge here, he ruled that long. And, and there was nothing else to comment on. You know, I mean, who, who knows what, the, what, what that look, look, looked like? Apparently, the author of Judges didn't know what it looked like, whether it was horrible or good or whatever. But the superiority of God's system was, is, is, is also evidenced in this. Um, you know, to, two things. Um, when Samuel says, you know, when, when, when the author of Samuel says that, hey, um, you know, uh, the, um, Samuel's sons perverted justice, right? They perverted justice. Do you remember what they were doing specifically? Offering strange fire. Um, no, that would be that would be um, that's Aaron's sons. I'm talking about Samuel's sons. 
Samuel as a judge. Samuel was judging Israel at the time. When they right before they wanted a new king, they brought up complaints against Samuel's sons. You remember what they were doing? Oh yeah, they were saying, um, "Give us all all the meat, or we'll, yes, we'll only right. take boiled meat instead of raw." Right, and they were sleeping around. Right, so that was the problem. That was the problem of the judges. Let's compare that with Jeroboam. God's complaint against Jeroboam was, you filled Jerusalem end to end with blood. So let's compare the two problems. You took more meat than you wanted to, and you were sleeping around. That's number one. The other one is, you filled Jerusalem end to end with blood. So comparatively speaking, why couldn't the judges do what Jeroboam did? Well, it's because in God's system, without a legislature, because, you know, uh, without the ability to um, take from people, uh, their own property. Uh, the king, when he was instituted, had now had that ability. He now had that power. And in some senses, he had that authority from the people to do that, as, as Samuel warned them. But the complaints against the, the, the perversions of the judges are just incomparable. They're incomparable to the perversions of the kings. Incomparable. It, you know, God never faulted a judge for leading Israel astray. He never did. He never faulted a judge. But he did fault kings for leading people astray. He faulted Jeroboam and he faulted Manasseh. He says, I'm putting you guys in exile because of these two people. It wasn't just that, but that's the reason God gave. He said, Manasseh filled Jerusalem and ended with blood, and Jeroboam filled Israel and ended with blood. And the, the, the judges couldn't do that because they didn't have the authority, they didn't have the power. And, and God's system kept them from being able to do that because if they, if they did, they would have. They would have. They would have done it if, if they had the power. They definitely would have done it. But they just didn't have the power to do it. It was just too localized. And secondly, you know, thinking about Christ, um, I, I try to really point this out to people. If you love Christ, then you have to love his his judicial system and his 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 law. Because they couldn't use the law to kill Christ. They couldn't use God's law against him. They tried. It didn't work. They brought in witnesses. They tried to do the stoning thing. Oh, we got him a blasphemy. And it didn't work. They couldn't kill him. They tried. Where did they have to go to? They had to go to man's law. They had to go to the state. They had to go to Rome. They had to. Because they couldn't use God's own system against him. He was found innocent. It says they tried and it was conflicting testimonies. They're like, ah, whatever. Let's take him to Rome to get, because we want to kill this guy. But Christ was able to walk again in, his, in freedom with his own law, within his own rules, with his own statutes and testimonies. He was able to do that. They had to go to pagan Rome to kill him. Trying to use his law against them was completely ineffective. They had to go to man's law. So if you love Christ, you got to love his law. You've got to see the superiority of his system that they could not use his own system against him. I think that is so interesting. And there's a testimony to the power uh, and the effectiveness of his law that he was able to walk in complete freedom. They tried to bring it to, to, get against, to go against him, and it didn't work. It's interesting what you bring up about judges versus kings. And judges, yes, you had all of these stints where people would fall into captivity, but then they would be freed from it in a relatively short amount of time. Yes. And all that was required was basically repentance. But then they, when a king would would be good and change things, it would say like so and so was was uh his heart was turned to the Lord and he he did good nevertheless the high places were not taken down. So it's right. like even though the king can have a heart for God, there are things that he still can't do. Right. Versus a judge is able to actually give the land rest. I would mm -hmm. kind of liken it to like somebody not being able to feel hunger pains. Everything would be going fine and then all of a sudden you just die. Mm -hmm. You feel fine and then you're just dead. Versus somebody who feels hungry, they may be starving and like debilitatingly hungry after mm -hmm. a month or two. And then they eat. But when you're debilitatingly hungry, you're still quite a few number of months away from actually dying. And so it's like, once you have a king, all of a sudden you become a little bit more numb to national problems. But when you have a judge, when you have this personal accountability amongst the people, you feel the consequences much more acutely, but also the consequences are not anywhere near as severe as just you're, you're being captivated, taken to Assyria, and you're all going to vanish off the face of the earth. And I would say that even, even the consequences um, are, are localized. 
they, they were localized in, in the book of Judges, right? So, I mean, I, I don't believe when it says, you know, Israel turned away, I don't think all of them did. I think some of them did. And I think some areas were given over, you know, it talks about some cities were taken sometimes, you know, this city was taken, this area was taken, all that kind of stuff it was localized. Whereas the, the king had the ability to institute injustice, where the judges never had that ability. They couldn't institute injustice, right? So if you had a corrupt judge and he perverted justice, the next judge has no obligation to be corrupt. Whereas as if you pass a statute and a law and say, ah, the king, you're not above the law. You got to follow the law, right? What if there's a corrupt law? Now I'm obligated to follow a corrupt law. I have no choice. I must, right? That's why I'm here. I have to enforce the law. It's a bad law, but hey, I got. I'm just doing my job. Hey, whatever, you know. But but with God's system, there is no corrupt law. You can't institute injustice. Whereas with a legislature, that's all you do. As soon as you pass a law that's outside of God's law, you're instituting injustice right away. Boom. You've just instituted injustice. And now we're all obligated to follow it. We all have to. We're, we're, we're forced to follow it. We're God's system. There is no injustice. So you're not, you're never obligated to be unjust. Whereas man's system, somewhere, anytime you reject, reject God's system, you are obligated to do unjust uh, things. You are obligated as a, as a magistrate or a citizen to be unjust because it, it's, so it's just a matter of time before it gets to you. But with a the theocratic system, you know, a, a lot of the people in this nation, they look to Donald Trump. I mean, can we talk? They just look to Donald Trump. Or if, if you're not a Trump fan, you probably just look to the state to solve all your problems for you. You know, a lot of people, that's just what they do. I'm not saying everybody does it, but there's a lot of people, that's what they do. But if if Christ was actually the, the, the recognized in our documents, in our covenants, in our... Uh, in our governments, if he was recognized officially, Christ is king of this nation, guess who the people would be crying out to for deliverance when there's a problem? We'd be crying out to Christ. We'd recognize him as the king. Okay, so what's the problem? It's X. Okay, who are we going to cry to? Christ, because he's the king. He's the ruler. He's the one running this show, right? Whereas right now, there's a problem. Here's X. And who do we run to? We run to our local government. Don't even give it up to prayer. You know? So, so you know, we we... Our, our founding documents, unfortunately, never recognized Christ. And, and, and uh, I'm talking about, you know, um, at, at the national level, right? A lot of state uh, constitutions did recognize God and Christ, right? But our constitution doesn't and best implies him, right? But that's, that's, that's not good enough to run a nation. You know, um, it, it, the Proverbs 3, 5, in all your ways acknowledge him. And this is a pretty big one to, in which to acknowledge. I mean, it's a pretty big one. This is the nation that runs, this is the document that runs the whole government. And we don't recognize it. We start off with we the people. And I just think that's an unforgivable, unforgivable um, mistake. You know, you, you just, you just, you can't start a nation with we the people. Now you could start, I don't care if you start off the phraseology with we the people recognize Christ as king. We the people do here and we and we, we establish this country and in so doing we recognize Christ as king. Eventually you got to come to say Christ is king. I don't, I don't really have a problem with the phraseology of we the people, but there is no standard in the constitution above we the people mentioned. It's just we the people, you know, and not to mention article six, which says this is supreme law of the land. All the judges have to judge by it, all that kind of stuff, you know. And it just doesn't jive with the Bible. It just doesn't jive with the Bible. And, and when we are in this, sorry, this is a long roundabout way of saying the long-term solution in, at, at the end of the chapter, when you talk about, you know, what's the application, uh, the short-term solution, I believe, is to, is to understand your local government and, and your sheriffs and the systems that you can use to repel advances of wickedness or even promote freedom. That's still possible with, within our system. Um, but the long-term solution, I really do believe, um, is uh, um, a change of heart towards the law. Um, I don't believe, uh, you know, some people have talked about, well, you know, to actually do this, we're going to need a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure if I really agree with that. Um, if there was, uh, if America fell tomorrow and there's a balkanization, there are enough Christians in this nation right now without any, without another single person being converted. There are enough Christians right now to run a new nation. Like say Rhode Island, you know, uh, we all and we became fifty countries. America was went kaput, and we became fifty fifty country, five thousand countries, whatever, uh, and we balkanized. I believe there are enough Christians right now 
to start a new country and and be and live faithfully. I don't think uh, we need a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit unless you call the balkanization a massive, out, uh, massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But I believe the long-term solution is a, is a heart change towards the law. We cannot, we are not equipped uh, right now uh, spiritually um, to, to start a new nation because we don't know what God's word has to say about how to run a country, and we don't care. Um, we, we don't know that, that, that God tells us how to run a nation. He actually became, told us how to be a nation before he told us how to be a church. Um, we, we, we don't know, we don't care that he, that he told us how to do these things. So if there was a reverse rapture tomorrow and all the wicked people were taken, all the righteous people were left, we try to do the constitution again or, or something similar. Or a, 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 although the, the founding fathers were probably more spiritual than we are, we probably make it worse. Um, so I, the long-term solution, I believe, is, is in our children, as we raise our children to say, okay, I know, I know that, that, that what happened in the beginning of this country, I believe, was, was blessed by God in many ways. In some ways it was not, but in many ways it was. But, you know, kids, we have a higher standard to live by. There's a higher standard for a country to live by. Righteousness exalts a nation. But we live, we live in this nation where the Constitution exalts this nation. That's just the way that it is. Um, and so righteousness exalts a nation, and the wicked do not understand justice, but the righteous understand it completely. Kids, when you're living through this life, don't say thus, say the, thus says the Constitution. Say thus says the Lord. And I believe that when, my prediction is that there will be a balkanization, and the Christians will have an opportunity, Lord willing, to start a nation. And when that time comes, I'm hoping people are wise enough uh, just like your basic Christian right now is wise enough to not do Catholicism again. Like they, they don't want to, I think your basic Christian, hey, do you want to do a Pope? They'd be like, no, 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 no. I don't want to do a Pope again. I know, oh, no, I, I just don't want to do a Pope. Uh, I don't think they could give you the whole history behind it, but I, I think they know the Pope is a bad, bad idea. So I believe my hope and prayer is that when the Balkanization happens, we are equipped and we are ready to say, okay, we have the opportunity. Here's what we're going to do. Here's where we went wrong. Here's what we're going to do right. And uh, we are equipped to start a new nation. That's my hope. That's what I believe the long-term solution is. God's people are supposed to judge themselves by these standards first, before like you get your own house in order, before you start looking to tell other people how to live. That's That's been one of the interesting things. And just going back to the thing of like, you know, you get down to the 10, the 10 people who decide who to judge, like that was Jethro's advice to his son-in-law. Moses, he's like, you're wearing yourself out. Like, if you look at a, a representative in the United States Senate, it's like each person is over, like, just under a million people. Right. Yeah. On, you can't on average. You can't represent all these people. You can't represent all of them. You can't. They don't, I'm not represented. Nobody cares what I think. I send an email. They send me a, it, it's like a, a quick response. Hey, thanks for your email. I'm concerned, blah, blah, blah. You know, they, you can't represent 350 million people. You can't. Yeah, you've got to have a, a ground level to where the complicated stuff, sure, works itself up to a, a Supreme Court of sorts. Mm -hmm. But then the simple stuff, people solve it themselves. But we're at a point where there are some really difficult things that people are like, you know what? I, you know, as difficult as this is, I think I'm just going to swallow it rather than call the cops because they're afraid once they bring it up to that level it's like it's basically going to wreck their lives even if they quote unquote succeed and it's ruled in their favor right the amount right. of money that it costs and and all this yeah. stuff and it's just to the point where you know the the constitution was right in that one sense where it says uh people are more or no the the declaration of independence people are more all history has shown that people are more predisposed to suffer while evils are sufferable i'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. than to than to right the wrongs Right. The, the Constitution and the Declaration were, were right about a lot of things. Um, the, but the, the unfortunate thing is just they, they gave the raw materials of tyranny to people who shouldn't have them. There's raw materials for tyranny in there. Of course, the, the God's judicial system never gives uh, the raw materials for tyranny. Um, it, it just it doesn't. It, it, tyranny is always localized. And in that sense, it's not really tyranny because tyranny usually extends to everybody in the nation. Um, where this is just in, where God's system is just it's 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 
you know, if you have a corrupt judge, then it just really applies to whoever's under that judge. Um, but since God's God does law doesn't have institutional injustice, you can't institutionalize injustice. You know? Yeah, it's got. I think it's getting to that point where people realize that, at least they say it. They say that they realize this, even if they don't act like they realize it. That just because somebody has a D in front of his name or an R in front of his name, or he's your local county judge, it doesn't mean you trust him. But I saw an article in the Gen Z and the millennials don't have any friends that they could really talk about something deep with. They have none. Not that they only have like one or two. They have none and they've never had an anybody and none of their friends have anybody that they know of either. And, yeah, you, I mean, I can rail against... um uh technology and stuff and technology is not bad our responsibility toward it is just really poor okay. to the point where you can feel like you know all these people but you don't really know any of them they've never been to your house yeah they you don't, they don't know you they've never met your family how can you really say that you know or trust somebody if you've never you know seen them working in their kitchen or right. sat at their table that's not a relationship And so you've got to get back to that point where if you had something crazy, I mean, it's like an insurance policy. You pray, you, you have this system in place that you hope that you never have to use. But because if you think about getting an insurance policy, once you need it, it's too late. You yeah. have to set that up in advance. You have to find people that you can trust in a difficult situation in advance. But how do you do that? Because uh, a lot of people are like, well... You really don't know who your friends are until things, something really terrible happens and you're put through a really hard situation. Well, that's the whole question about like, how do you find people who are trustworthy before things get really tough? Who you know you can rely on. Right. It's just back to the basic thing. It's like, have you been, have you been assigned an elder? Have you been assigned somebody who's in authority over you? I think God's design is for the people to choose for themselves. And you either reap the consequences of that, good or bad. I think it's Deuteron it's in Deuteronomy, I forget which chapter, but it's like, choose for yourself judges and officials in all your towns, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. It wasn't, I will appoint for you a king, it was, choose for yourselves. Mm -hmm. And then, so if they give you a ruling that you don't like, whose fault is that? That's yours, you picked the wrong guy pick somebody right. else. But now right. that take that's a that's a level of personal responsibility that you have to be willing to take. You can't just say, "Oh, these people, these they put this person in front of me so I can moan and complain." Right, right. It's no, I haven't put the right person above me. God mm -hmm. told me to choose. Who would I choose? Right. How would I start pursuing that kind of relationship? The people that I've asked have been honored and flattered, but they've also said no. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, hmm, it's a weird kind of conundrum. The people who are willing to do it, I don't trust. And the people who I trust are not willing to do it. <laughs> so it's catch 22. Yeah. Yeah. Period of God's system um, where um, a lot of the judges who judge Israel weren't really aspiring to be judges, were they? It's, um, you know, I don't think Deborah was aspiring to be a judge. You know, it often says, you know, they were going to this judge. They, they, Israel was going to this person for judgment. And it wasn't a position that I think anyone was like, oh, I want to be the head judge of Israel. Um, I, it, it was, it was, you know, you, you had wisdom or you had renown or people trusted you. And so they went to you. Um, and, and that way the, the leader was chosen as basically voting. Um, and uh, I, whereas, whereas, you know, you, you meet a lot of kids or people today and they aspire to be in positions of power. Um, and, uh, it's not a good, it's not a good aspiration in, in the way that it exists now. Humble people by nature will refuse to tell people how to live. And we've made positions that tell people how to live. So who are they going to naturally be, by, by whom are they going to be naturally, be naturally peopled? They are going to be naturally peopled by people who are not humble because a humble person wants to live and let live. He wants to be left alone. He doesn't want to tell people what to do. He wants them to have the same freedoms that he has. Whereas our system right now with the uh, politicians, um, that's all you do is you tell people how to live. You make new laws and you push people around and say, now you got to think this way. Now you got to do this way. Uh, you have to do this. This is a law for everybody. So you're pushing people around and telling them what to do. But humble people don't want to do that. So who's going to be who's going to be uh, who's, who's going to be attracted to this position? Not humble people. 
frauds. It's going to attract frauds. Whereas I think the judicial system of God's design, I don't think it naturally attracts judges. I, I mean, uh, frauds. It naturally attracts people who are wise, people who are trustworthy. And willing servants. Yeah, I think it was a, uh, I'm not a fan of H.L. Mencken, but he has some very uh, biting quotes. And one of them that he had that I liked was, I think it's by H.L. Mencken. Uh, he said that the only requirement for a politician to win is to get people to like him. That's the only job qualification. And it's the only one that doesn't matter. Yes, yeah, and, and if you, uh, so that doesn't matter exactly. And if, uh, if, if you decide to uh, be unlikable for the rest of your term in office, who cares? Yeah, you, you got in and now you can do the rest of it, you know, within, within a certain amount of unreasonable yeah, right. standards. But that's the whole thing. I think it was Robert Murphy. He's a, he's a Christian. He's an economist. I think he's a very good economist. Um, I had him on my show a few years ago, but he had an article that struck me years ago. It's on Mises.org, but it's the idea of having a free market system of, by which judges are chosen. And it's not, you're not, um, in it for a certain amount of time. There's no term. Uh, but to think about it more as a court, as a business, it's a service. Uh, right. You know, why do people buy Apple products? Is it because Apple's out there telling everybody how good they are and trying to warp people's sense of, of their own reliability? It's no, you call Apple and they will answer the phone and you tell them your complaint and they will fix it or they will yeah. give you your money back. You know, that type of stuff. Like that's what we think of as a good business. All of a sudden, when it comes to somebody who has authority, the exact opposite is how it is how it works. That seems backwards. And you should be able to get somebody out the next day, right? If something yeah. crazy happens. Yep, yeah. and and that's there's no since there's no legislature, no one gets qualified immunity. So, and that's one of the first things that that legislatures do when they get into power is that they start making a hedge around themselves to be immune from. The laws that they make, and uh, judges can't do that. Any judge can be dragged into court. Any, I, I even think the head judge can be dragged into court too. I think he can be. I think he has a judge of ten. You know, if you're a citizen of the country, you came from a judge of ten. Who is that person? You know, I, I believe that you can even the top people you can drag into court. I'm not even a fan of having a top person. Uh, I think it's in uh, the Deuteronomy in the teens somewhere, but it talks about the appeal process. And it goes from a judge who says that the case is too hard for him. So number one, you have to have a judge who's humble enough to say, right. I don't know. This is very hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> When's the last time a judge was told to do that? But like our, our system now is it's the person who lost the case has the option to appeal. What? Well, they, of course, why wouldn't you take that opportunity every single right. time? <laughs> but no, it's a judge. And if he thinks he's confident enough and he gives his answer, then he, there is no appeal. Sorry. And if you disobey what he says, then you die. Right. But when well, he appeals, it says you take it to the priests and it says priests, plural. So you go to a panel whenever you have to do an appeal. You don't go to just like the head guy. You start with a bunch of people and if they can't figure it out, it's one person. I thought it was only the priest when when the judge um, when there was no judge there when he didn't have a judge then he took it to the priest. I thought that's what the passage was saying that if there's no judge there you take it to the priest. The I priest judge. think it. I think that passage, the one that I'm thinking of, it's it talks about if the judge said if there's a case that arises that's too difficult for you to decide in any of your towns. I, I assume that that's meant by a judge, but maybe I suppose that would apply if there is no judge whatsoever. I mean, and I suppose that could apply too, because if there's no judge, well, then it's up to the people to figure stuff out. Well, and, and well, see, and I'm, I, that's that's an interesting thing because Solomon was performing the role of judge, and I don't think there's anybody above him. You know, he was getting all the difficult cases, and they were going to him, and he was figuring them out. And I'm not sure that there might be. Uh, that might be interesting if there is a case where even the head judge can't figure it out he goes before a panel so that's interesting okay that's something for me to think about yeah and there's some more there's some more thinking on that whole thing that i'd like to do as well um but yeah it's it, the whole the whole government system is supposed to be built on the idea that authority can only be given authority can never be taken i can't take authority for myself i can only give authority to other people Right. 
Yes. And you certainly can't, uh, can't legislate the authority around yourself. As- and obviously Christ being our example of the ultimate person who has the ultimate authority, even he doesn't take authority for himself. He gives authority to us and that's what makes him great. So it's like, it's a chicken and the egg situation with God. Is God great because he gives authority or does he give authority because he's great? I would say they're inseparable. In any case, rise requiring decision between one kind of homicide and another, and one kind of legal right and another, and one kind of salt and another, in case of intent. You shall rise and go to the place the Lord God will choose, and you shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who was in office in those days. You shall consult them, and they shall declare to you to, to you the decision. And to the judge. You shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who was in office in those days, and you shall consult them, and they shall declare to you a decision. Okay. Anyway, but the one I, I can't find the one I'm talking about where it says if there's no judge there, you can't find a judge, then take it to a take it to a, a, a Levite, and a Levite will judge for you. So it seems that the Levites were all judges by by nature. Yeah, there's some interesting stuff there too. I don't know necessarily the significance of it, but uh, you've got the Levites and you've got priests and then you've got Kohathites, and they're all sons of Aaron. They're all of the tribe of Levi, but the Kohathites are a subgroup, and the priests are a subgroup of the, of the levites because right, right. the, the kohathites who are in charge of like taking up the temple stuff that was one other thing oh did i wanted to ask i can't remember if it was you or if it was uh uh chris i, I made that little um video about the uh, uh rolling stone saying that they reached out and the the person delivering the package i don't know if you remember that I said, I do remember that. Yes. I tagged Chris in that and I said, accurate. Yeah. <laughs> I did that at like two o'clock in the morning and I was just laughing myself stupid because of how brilliant I thought that that was. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would get more of a reaction. I was kind of bummed that like nobody really uh, responded to it. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was funny. And that's why I tagged Chris. I was like, this is, this is basically what happened. All right. Well, thanks Luke. Um, Hopefully we'll we'll connect maybe someday at a conference or something. Lord willing.